Well, hello again. And I think, first of all, I better apologize for the fact that I look a little bit like a cross between a mad professor and the wild man of Borneo. Lockdown plays havoc, even with a very limited hairstyle like my own. At any rate, today we're looking at uh, Nehemiah chapter two. We're going to be thinking about Nehemiah's purpose. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. I hadn't been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take? When will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, and so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citizen uh, by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence that I'll occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and I gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sambal at the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I hadn't told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me, except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jer Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved along towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall, Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials didn't know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we'll no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. Their reply was, let's start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. So far, we've looked at Nehemiah's God and Nehemiah's prayer. Today, the story re really begins to pick up speed as we look at Nehemiah's purpose. Now, if I was to ask you, what's God's purpose for your life? I wonder what you'd say. What is God's purpose for your life? Or, or mine, for that matter? 
It's a question I think that's got an answer on two different levels. First of all, there is the big purpose of God for all his people, in which you and I have got a part. If you'd asked Nehemiah about this big overarching purpose, I think he might have answered something like this. Well, God's purpose for me as part of his chosen people is that I should obey his commands and honour him, live for him, and be his witness in the world. What would we say? Well, the New Testament has more than one way that it states this, but here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. God's purpose is to make us his beloved sons and daughters, part of the family of God forever in Christ. To this end, through Jesus, he's forgiven us, he's put us into a right relationship with himself to make us holy and blameless. And this isn't just a purpose for our own sakes, but so that we can enable others to know his grace and praise his glory, so that one day everyone and everything in creation will be brought together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now that, according to Ephesians chapter 1, is God's purpose for our lives. It is the great story that we're part of. And everything that we are, everything that we do, needs to serve that one great overarching purpose. At the deepest, most significant level, this is what we're about. This is what we're here for. And we're in it together. This is not my purpose. It's not your individual purpose. It's our purpose together in Christ. But then there's also a second level at which we need to find God's purpose for our lives, and that's the individual level. The individual level that will reflect our unique personalities and gifts, our life opportunities and circumstances. Because God knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly how he wants to work through you. And it's that that we're looking at today. As our reading begins, Nehemiah has for a long time known what God's big universal purpose for him and his people is. But he's only just realized the specific work that God has for him as an individual. The penny has just dropped. He realizes now that God has put him in the court of King Artaxerxes because it is from that situation that he can do something nobody else in the world can do to rescue God's people in Jerusalem. There are four great qualities, at least, that Nehemiah brings to this purpose of God for his life, and all of them are things that apply to us as well. In the first place, Nehemiah has the wisdom to find God's purpose. Clearly, as he's been praying, he's been engaging with the question, what can I do? And he's aware of three things as he does so. First of all, he's aware of need. Uh, his whole prayer is driven by the desperate need of his people in Jerusalem. He's driven by his circumstances. He, he is the cupbearer to the king. Now, that doesn't give him great status or prestige, but it does give him one very priceless asset. He has regular personal access to Artaxerxes. And then thirdly, I'm sure that he is also aware of his own particular temperament and gifts. He's an organiser, he's a born leader. He's somebody who's able to plan. Now, when we come to the New Testament, you see a similar picture. God has specific roles for each one of us as members of the Church of Jesus Christ. How do we come to know what God wants us to do? Well, the answer is going to reflect the same three factors. First of all, there's need. God gives spiritual gifts to individuals, but those gifts are not for individuals, but they're for the church and for each other. So if we want to know God's purpose for us, one very important clue is to look around us and see what the needs are. Secondly, circumstances will also come into play. You know, a homeless person wouldn't be in much of a position to practice hospitality, but somebody with their own home can be. There are things that the Apostle Paul could do on his missionary journeys that he could never still do when he was in prison. And the same goes for us. Whoever we are, God has purposes for us. Obviously, those purposes are going to be shaped by our circumstances. 
And then there's temperament and gifts. The New Testament has a strong emphasis on the particular gifts that God gives to each of us. And so if you want to know what God's purposes are for you as an individual, the sort of questions you want to be asking yourself are, well, what am I good at? What do I enjoy doing? What is it that I have a passion for? And I wonder if God can use that. There's a, a line that you might remember from the film Chariots of Fire, where Eric Liddell says, I feel that God has made me to run. That's his gift and it's his passion. Now, he might have looked at his running and thought, well, God surely can't use that. But God did, of course. And the story of how Eric Liddell chose to honour God at the 1924 Paris Olympics by declining to run on a Sunday, but ending up with a gold medal nonetheless, that story is still being told. And nearly 100 years later, it still inspires. The gifts that God has actually given us, of course, may not always be the gifts that other people think he ought to have given us. Silly example of that. When I became the pastor of our church in Birmingham, my predecessor had been a superb DIY man. Anything practical, he could do it. He mended people's cars. He did all kinds of wonderful practical stuff. So a couple of days before the first service of Believer's Baptism, I got a visit from a guy who was setting things up for the Sunday. He came in the front door. The baptistry pump's broken down. Can you come and fix it? This is obviously the thing that pastors do. Well, there was a very simple two-letter answer to that, and it began with the, the letter N. I mean, I could no more fix electrical problems than I, I could walk on the moon. It would have been lunacy to pretend that I could. Now, there will be times when God takes us outside our comfort zone, but mostly, not quite always, but mostly, God shapes his purposes for us in line with the people that he's created us to be. Nehemiah finds his purpose. Secondly, Nehemiah has the courage to pursue God's purpose for his life. Now, unless you know the history of this, it's easy to miss just how much of a risk Nehemiah is taking in the reading that we had as he brings his request to King Artaxerxes. For a start, a cupbearer does not speak to the king unless he's spoken to. And if Nehemiah manages to upset the king, it only takes one word from him and he's a dead man. It is a position of extreme vulnerability. He is always only one word from death. But then what makes it even worse is that when the local officials had previously complained about the Jews trying to build a wall around Jerusalem, when that had happened before, Artaxerxes had taken their side and he had stopped the work. So Nehemiah is in an exceptionally tricky situation. But he acts with a combination of extraordinary courage and wonderful care. He lets Artaxerxes take the initiative. He does his work as usual, but with a face as long as a cucumber. Maybe he's been crying and he doesn't trouble to disguise the fact. And eventually Artaxerxes asks, what on earth is the matter, man? You don't seem ill, but looking at you, anyone would think the world's just come to an end. Now there's real concern, I think in Artaxerxes' question, and it is Nehemiah's opportunity. He grabs hold of that opportunity with both hands, and in verse 3 he says, I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Please understand, O king, that I am utterly loyal to you, but What's happening to my people is a source of great, great sadness to me. Now, this is a moment of maximum danger, but the, the danger passes. The king said to me, what is it that you want? Nehemiah says, I would very much like to go back to my home city and help rebuild it. And again, that, that's a situation of real danger, isn't it? Artaxerxes could very readily have said, well, look, you've pushed your luck too far now. 
You've mistaken my sympathy for weakness. Who do you think you are? Guards take him away. Could have happened like that, but it doesn't. How long do you need, Nehemiah? And here's where Nehemiah gets really cheeky. Actually, I think I'm going to need letters of safe conduct for my journey. I'm also going to need timber from the Royal Park. Sharp intake of breath at this point if you're a bystander. Actually, Artaxerxes is fine with all of this. Perhaps he wants a man of proven loyalty and integrity on his unstable border with Egypt. But basically he says, yes, fine, you can have all that you've asked for. And actually I'll throw in a military escort so that I make sure you get there safely. Not many of us will need that kind of outrageous level of courage in order to pursue God's purpose for our lives. But courage is indeed often needed. And of course, Nehemiah had it in spades. The third thing that he does is he has energy to plan for God's purpose for his life. He arrives in Jerusalem and with the military escort and all folks must have wondered what on earth he was there for. A bigwig from Artaxerxes himself with soldiers and cavalry in tow? Tongues must have been wagging. But for three days, Nehemiah says nothing. He says stum. Probably he does a lot of listening, a lot of taking stock, but he says nothing. And then secretly at night, he does a recce around the outside of Jerusalem, just him and a small posse of others. Secretly, because actually not everyone is on his side and security is very poor. He takes stock of the state of the walls, broken down, and the gates of the city, burnt to cinders, right off. He makes sure that he has all the relevant facts at his fingertips. And then he goes to the Jewish leaders. Guys, it's time to start rebuilding the walls. I know the need's desperate, but, but this time we've got the Persian king on our side. God has led me here and we can do it. He's planned for that moment. There is an old saying, if we fail to plan, then we plan to fail. There's a bit of truth in that. And in the story of Nehemiah, there's plenty of prayer and a bit of waiting too. But the purpose of God for our lives does not come when we just pray and meditate. Neither does it come just by waiting for something to happen. Throughout this process, Nehemiah's worked out a strategy, a strategy with Artaxerxes to trigger the king's concern and his question. And then also... A strategy to know what he was going to need in order to take up the task and do it properly. A strategy to get the feel for what was going on in Jerusalem once he arrives. A strategy to take stock of the size of the challenge facing him. And a strategy to get his people on board. You know, it's always a good question to ask ourselves. If X, Y or Z is God's purpose for my life. What concretely do I need to do in order for that to happen? And that's not because we can ever make it happen by ourselves, by our own strength. We can't. But it is because God calls us not just to be pawns that he can push around on the chessboard, but responsible people who will partner with him. So it's a good and necessary question. What do I need to do for God's purpose to be worked out in my life right now? Fourth thing about Nehemiah, he had the endurance to keep going. Now we're going to see an awful lot more of this as the story unfolds, but at every stage in his God-given mission, the odds seem to be stacked against Nehemiah. He has to persuade the king to let him go. He has to meet the logistical challenges that come with a major building project. Worst of all, he's doing all of that in the context of a bunch of really quite powerful men who are not just willing him to fail, they're busting a gut to make sure that he fails. Even here, right in chapter 2, we read that Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, are disturbed by developments. And so they ridicule the project, they talk it down, they make threats. It looks to me as if you're rebelling against the king. It's a very damaging accusation. 
And what they're saying is we stopped a project like this once before by bad mouthing it to Artaxerxes and we can do that again. You know, if we do what God is calling us to do, we will not face universal acclamation. Not everybody will be thrilled. Not every circumstance will ever go our way. There will be times when we very much feel like giving up. When the New Testament talks about God's power given to his church, most of the time it's not talking, as we might expect, about doing miracles or achieving spectacular successes. Most of the time when it's talking about God's power in the church, it's talking about strength to endure, to persevere, to keep on going through difficulties and opposition. Good example is in the section in Ephesians 6 on the armor of God, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. When, uh, therefore, put on the whole armor of God that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. You'll need power just to stay standing, the power of God given to us to be the last man standing in the battle. Nehemiah needed endurance, so do we. Well, you might have been listening to all of this and thinking, well, it sounds like a message you give to a bunch of university students with their lies stretching out in front of them, all the possibilities in the future. And with apologies to our token younger MWS members, this really isn't for us old wrinklies who have, as they say, got a great future behind us. Well, I take the point. We're not for the most part spring chickens, are we? We're, we're not facing questions of what our career is going to be, how we're going to sort of use the, the many years of the rest of our lives, how to train for our life's work. That ship sailed oh many years back, but still. But still, God's purpose for us did not come to an end when we picked up our bus pass. And it does not come to an end even when we're locked down in our own homes. And I would encourage you to engage with the question of how God wants to work in your life this year, this month, this week, even tomorrow. Chapter before in the Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what God's will is. What can I learn? Who can I bless? Who can I help in this time? What good can I do or what good can I say or write? How does God want to use your tomorrow, your next week? Well, ask him. Have the courage to take the initiative, even if it feels like a bit of a risk. Find concrete ways to begin to make it happen. And not least, keep going. Don't give up. Even if you have, as we all will, set have setbacks and bad days. I wonder if you'd like to finish um, um, joining this, this prayer with me. Father God, most of us aren't quite in our halcyon days anymore. We have more of our lives behind us than ahead of us, but Lord, thank you that in the kingdom of God, nobody is a back number. Nobody is a discarded model. Father, I'm reminded that hundreds of years after they died, you said of them, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. So, Lord, help us at this point in our lives to find the purposes that you have for our days, to seize those purposes, to live them. And, Lord, as we do that, to know the sense of fulfillment always comes when we know that we're in the center of your will. And Father, would you pour down your blessing on each member of our congregation in the different circumstances that we're in at this moment. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, goodbye for now. God bless you. And uh,
hopefully next week we will uh, have some more fellowship news coming out and in a couple of weeks we'll be looking at Nehemiah's team as they get to work. Bye for now.